going to start the presentation with a video about Canty's grandmother, who was one of the founders of the Raleigh Rose Garden. Canty Sutton, I think, is a real example of a Renaissance person. She excelled in so many different areas. She was a talented artist, she was a writer, she was a hostess, but above all other things, she was a really wonderful philanthropist and a great leader. And without her, we wouldn't have the Raleigh Little Theater complex as it is today. The theater itself, the Rose Garden, the amphitheater, it was really largely due to her efforts as building chairman and uh, as a person who wouldn't take no for an answer. Probably one of my favorite quotes about her describes her, her as a theatrical Joan of Arc waging a one-woman battle against the bureaucracy of the WPA. That was what Guy Munger said about her, that she was just a real force of nature. Um, she was the kind of person who had a vision about something that community needed and that she set about to make it happen. Once the theater was built, though, her job wasn't done yet. She envisioned a rose garden. She said, we've got this beautiful space here, why don't we develop it? And so once again, she went out and she asked the city, you know, can we build a rose garden here? And then she went out and raised the funds. And then 10 years later, the Raleigh Rose Garden was completed and dedicated in 1951. Canty Venable Sutton was also an accomplished artist who had her art exhibited in a number of different places. You know, she was not somebody who just was a champion of the arts, but she was also an artist herself. Raleigh in the 1930s was a much smaller community, and it was uh, not nearly, you know, as, as cosmopolitan as it is today, much like many places are. And I think that Canty Venable Sutton was an early person who was a leader in this community who showed how important the arts were to transforming communities. If she was able to see where Raleigh is as a community, and specifically the Raleigh Little Theater, she would be really gratified to know that over a million people have gotten to visit the campus and take in shows and enjoy the Rose Garden and things like that. Because I mean, I think she always envisioned this as a place that generations would be able to enjoy and would really improve the quality of life for everybody in Raleigh. Uh, before I start, may I just ask how many of you have ever been to Raleigh and been to the Raleigh Rose Garden campus at all? Just a few. Well, the invitation is open and standing. Please come. What unites our talks today, I think, is the spirit and the inspiration of Canty Venable Sutton, under whose umbrella both of the Jessies seem to have come to the places where they are. And so this is where we're kind of um, matching uh, different kinds of inspiration. I can't wait to hear about the making of the sculpture. We're going to start with the making of the garden where Jessie's twin sister now resides in Raleigh. Um, so a second reason for the connection here is that when Canty Sutton envisioned the campus of the Raleigh Little Theater, and I'm going to talk specifically about the garden, the history of the building has been done with many, many more pages and pictures and details than, than I could offer to you here, but the garden itself is um, a work uh, that des it deserves its own mention. She envisioned it as a place in the capital city where the citizens of North Carolina could come and enjoy a spot of beauty and inspiration. She felt that the capital city should offer these places to everybody in North Carolina. So it's not just for Raleigh or the vicinity, but it's for all of us who enjoy our state. Um, she is certainly an example of the idea that all gardening is a landscape painting. And this is a painting of the garden. Um, I would say, we never did find a date on this, probably in the 1970s. I don't know, Kathy, if you had any other um, idea about, you know, as you know her work better. But this is the garden come to fulfillment. And she painted this, it's a much larger canvas than it looks like here, and it hangs in the theater as a proud representation of what her imagination was able to bring about. But before there was um, the garden, there was the idea of the whole campus, more than six acres, and I don't want to be exclusionary in mentioning that the building on the right contains now two theaters, a huge amphitheater which has been in constant use since 1939, 
all of this was a vision that was driven by Candy Sutton. And it's just a remarkable achievement for a person, and she would be the first to tell you, she didn't do it all by herself, but I think we would all be the first to say without her it would never have happened. Uh, she struggled with the WPA, with the building and the grounds. She struggled with senators, with governors, um, with any number of people, even with wheelbarrows. As she trucked water into the garden the first year, it became uh, viable because there was no irrigation system. She quickly fixed that. But anyway, this is an image of the whole campus, and you can <coughs> see the horseshoe of the Rose Garden right there in the center of it. But before there was Canty Sutton, there was a history to the land, and I wanted to just give you a sense of it so you can see what the accomplishment of this garden really represents. In the 1870s, there were uh, a number of families in West Raleigh who sold land to the North Carolina Agricultural Society so that they could move the state, what we know as the State Fair, from east of the Capitol building in Raleigh to a larger location. So from 1870, um, Let's see what my dates are. One second, 1873 until um, 1925, the North Carolina State Fair occupied all of the grounds that later became the Rose Garden. And it was a huge complex, it went all the way from Hillsborough Street, if you know Raleigh, where the college is, west into um, what were then the fields and later became some of the first um, suburbs. Uh, this is one of the pictures of the developed fairgrounds. Another part of this was, however, in 1917 and 1918, as part of the World War I effort, the fairgrounds were converted into Camp Polk, and it was a camp for training um, tank maneuvers. And so part of the Rose Garden what not only housed all of these soldiers, but also provided the hills for them to go up and down in the tanks. And when you see what the garden looks like today, and it's completely wooded on the hillsides with great, beautiful, tall, mature trees, uh, it's kind of amazing to realize that it wasn't that long ago that this is what it looked like. In uh, 1920, there were a lot of buildings associated with the fairgrounds. There was one racetrack. And the woman who was then president of the board of the North Carolina Agricultural Society decided there needed to be a second racetrack. Her name was Mrs. Edith Stuyvesant Vanderbilt, and yes, she was the Vanderbilt from west of here. She wanted a second racetrack for all kinds of reasons. Mortgaged the, the board mortgaged the property to pay for it, and you know what happened in the 20s. Everything went south. The fairgrounds went bankrupt, and they had to sell the property. The city was kind enough for a dollar to sell them the property where the state fairgrounds are today, west of um, Meredith College in Raleigh. And this property was then turned over to developers who had purchased it to create one of the new suburbs in Raleigh. So here are the fairgrounds, and it, here's her signature on one of the membership cards. And this is the city of Raleigh at the time. The pink circle on the screen shows you where the fairgrounds were and the Rose Garden, the complete west border of the city. That's how far out it was and how small a community Raleigh was at the time as well. So here is what became of the fairgrounds. It was turned into the Fairmont neighborhood. And we have streets in the Fairmont neighborhood like Vanderbilt and Clark and Pogue are named after the board members of the North Carolina Agricultural Society. So people wonder, where did these names come from? There's a history to it. Now, when the developers bought the property, they soon discovered that the horseshoe in the center was not buildable. And so the city stepped in, bought that piece of land and another piece adjacent. And ever since 1926, these properties, the other has also been made into a city park, have belonged to the city of Raleigh. So there is an understanding with the theater complex and the garden complex about who runs what and who manages what. And it's been a very wonderful partnership, I think, for many years. This is what it looked like. <laughs> so you can understand why it was called the old mud hole. Well, enter the Raleigh Little Theater players, among whom we found Canty Tanner. I'm sorry, <laughs> Canty uh, Sutton. 
and they wanted a permanent home for their theatrical organization. And long story short, they organized, they uh, were galvanized under the leadership of Canty Sutton. They ended up with WPA funding to build the theater complex that you saw a minute ago. Their first production in 1939 was in the amphitheater. And as you saw in the film, Canty Venable Sutton was just tenacious about this, the Joan of Arc of theater. And it wasn't just the theater, it was the whole theater complex that she was interested in. There's not any absolute certainty when she got the idea for the Rose Garden. There was always an idea for a garden. And some sources contend that she had it all along, others not so sure. But here is the very first rendering of what the whole complex was supposed to look like. And you'll see there's very little gardening in the center. It's just a grassy panel uh, with the theater building. Um, they did all kinds of fundraising. Here's a more developed image of the campus map. They begin to get the sense of the arboretum and the flower panels on the side. So it turned into something much more elaborate when it was finally finished, as, as you now know. But in the 1939 concept of the theater, really the landscape plantings around the original building were the most important ones. Uh, they broke ground in 39. Um, here we are in the amphitheater. You get a sense again of how desolate this landscape was. It looks completely infertile. You know, cement can grow there, but not much else. And here's the complex when it was finished in 1940. So in order to landscape it, Canty Sutton put the call out to gardeners, gardening centers, individuals, garden clubs, anybody who had a bush, a shrub, a tree, or a bulb who would donate it to come and landscape this building. And that is how it was landscaped originally. And the building itself, there was a supervising uh, landscaper from the city of Raleigh. But around the front of the building, the gardener who worked hardest and most on it was Elizabeth Lawrence. And some of you who know your North Carolina gardening history will know she's one of North Carolina's most prominent gardeners. She was at Raleigh at the time, finished her life out in Charlotte, and was part of the wing, she, her home is Wing Haven in Charlotte, if you've been there. Well, the landscaping was lovely for a year, and then a drought hit, and then um, World War II hit, and then everybody came home from the war, and things went from there. The mayor, and you can see the little tiny pink wall now circle, see how much more Raleigh has developed in those 23 years. All of a sudden, it's more in the center of town than it is on the far western outskirts. Recreational activity, especially for young people, was a huge issue in the 40s. And the mayor of Raleigh wanted to turn the grassy panels at the Raleigh Little Theater into tennis courts and use the green rooms as the dressing rooms. Well, that's not going to happen. And so Canty Sutton, once again, she created a Rose Garden Committee, of which she was the head. She went down to the city council with a plan and a budget, and she got the garden set, approved, budgeted for two years. They didn't budget irrigation, as I mentioned. Uh, but the, the garden begins to grow, and you can get a sense here of the shape of it is beginning to take, take hold. Uh, in those early days, the garden was not without residents. It had a lot of visitors who came to see the progress. But because housing was so in such short order in Raleigh, the creative director of the theater moved his family into one of the dressing room stone houses at the amphitheater. And the little boy who grew up there for two years, William Ivy Long, some of you may know his name, he's a very celebrated costume designer on Broadway. And he spent the first two years of his life in the garden. He knew Canty Sutton. She always had candy for him. He came back a few years ago, and we memorialized the little stone house where they had a sink and they had a stove, and they had to go into the big building for showers. So he, he uh, remembers her finally working on the garden. <coughs> it begins to grow, 49. You can see the arbor and the bushes taking place. There's a garden pool. There's Mrs. Sutton, I have to call her Mrs. Sutton in this picture. She, according to the gardener who worked the longest with her, she never came without a suit. She was always dressed, and you can see her tending the roses in a typical fashion. Uh, it was dedicated in 1951, handed off to the city, 
and uh, there's the plaque memorializing the pond, which I think this would be your great-grandparents, Canty. Um, a garden shel shelter added in 52. It becomes a, land a landmark place to visit, and it's publicized in the newspapers, uh, our state magazine, which has been in existence forever and a day, I think, uh, ran articles about it. It became part of the postcard uh, legacy of North Carolina. This one from the collection at Wilson Library over at UNC. And in 1990, along with the building, was designated a historic property in Raleigh. So um, there was a mission somewhere that got developed for the garden. Uh, just the, the last part of it is probably the most interesting and important that it's an oasis in an urban setting for people of all ages to explore and experience. Uh, Anne Preston Bridgers, who was a playwright and a colleague of uh, Canty Sutton, said that the purpose from the beginning was a very democratic organization where people could come for entertainment, for recreation, for creativity. And I think uh, Mrs. Sutton would be pleased 80 some years now since her vision of this garden, that it is a magnificent place. If you haven't come to visit, please come. Uh, the roses are most beautiful Mother's Day through October. There's something blooming all the time during the summer. The uh, city of Raleigh three years ago undertook a major renovation project to um, uh, fix the irrigation system, which if you can believe it, had never been changed since the 1950s. It was certainly in need of some help. And they had some drain uh, runoff issues they had to address, but they put the garden back into as much of its original design as possible. Uh, in uh, writing this book that you'll see back here, and I'll refer you to the Raleigh Little Theater website as well, the city of Raleigh also helped do a complete mapping of the property, all the hardscapes, all the rose bushes, the names of the rose bushes and the location. And when the city had to dig them all up for the renovation, they put them back as well as they could in right order, and then went through and uh, corrected anything they could about which bushes are named what. Thought was a shame you couldn't go in the rose garden and say, what is that? The last bush that Mrs. Sutton herself was responsible for, uh, climbing silver moon rose, was gone by 2006. So there's that kind of um, passing on in the garden, the legacy. Uh, it is now what it is uh, and has wonderful memories of the other roses that were there before. There used to be an annual competition where the <coughs> Rose Society would select 20 winning roses and they would send samples to gardens across the country. So for many years, the uh, garden was the recipient of American Rose Society award winners. I don't think, I think they've quit doing that around 2001. That's one of the most celebrated rose gardens in the state. Daniel Stowe may be now um, a very celebrated one, certainly a freshman garden compared to this one, and uh, the Elizabethan gardens, which are much older. So there are roses, the arbor, which unfortunately does not have roses planted on it any longer. Um, beautiful, beautiful mature trees, over 160 trees planted around the shape of the arbor, of, of the uh, horseshoe, a shade garden. It's a place of inspiration. Many artists come there. I keep thinking we need to do a plein air experience like Brahm does uh, at some point. And uh, pre-pandemic, there were any number of different things that were held in the garden. Music events, festivals, plays, of course, uh, art in the garden, uh, you name it, weddings, family celebrations, Pokemon, which may have, you know, we may be done with Pokemon now, sunrise yoga, uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful legacy. And the creation of a woman whose vision came true and today sustains us. So I'm very excited to see the more sculpture side of this same kind of vision. Kathy? Thanks, Shelley. Shelley has just been amazing for Raleigh Little Theater and the Garden. She's our historian. She's written the little book that's in the back. Um, we are very blessed to have had Shelley, as I'm sure has been president of the board of RLT. Um, 
just given countless hours, but um, now we'll start talking about the creation of Jesse, the sculpture Jesse, and I have to start with the beginning, um, and that's my grandmother, and the influence, it took me years to realize the influence she had on my life. Um, that is the earliest and hopefully only topless picture of me <laughs> in circulation. <laughs> but I spent every summer, uh, every summer of my life, and continue to at our beach house that my grandfather built the year I was born, 1948. And it, they were wonderful summers. As, as long as my grandparents were living, uh, Mimi, we called her Mimi, um, had my siblings and I posed for countless hours doing portraits of us. But it was also fun to go out on the beach or sit up in her third story room and do landscapes. She loved doing landscapes, seascapes. Um, Which beach? Atlantic Beach. Um, she, as the video said, she was a singer, she was an actor, she was an author, she wrote books, um, she was a musician, and she was a painter. Uh, she found all sorts of ways to express her creativity, as well as being a community um, activist and philanthropist. Um, I grew to admire the woman she became, and as I say, did not realize the influence on my life. As I was growing up, I was exploring all sorts of ways to be creative. I always sat in class and sketched. I'd sketch um, portraits of my professors or my teachers, I'd sketch legs and arms of anybody sitting close to me. I was fascinated by the figure. Um, home Ec had to have been my favorite class <laughs> in junior high school. And it's just, I can't believe it's not offered anymore. I, I learned to cook, I learned to sew, I learned all the, if I could have taken shop, I certainly would have, but that was not offered. But I went from sewing my dresses, my children's clothes, all the draperies in our first house, and from there went on to upholstering. Just love discovering, as I'm sure many of you have, all the things that you can do. It's so empowering to learn the things you could do. Um, jewelry making, just you name it. I experimented. Um, but when it came to choosing a career, it didn't occur to me to go into the arts, I was also fascinated with psychology. So I uh, ended up majoring in psychology, <laughs> and I practiced for seven years, uh, several of them with Ed Holscher, who, who made you here a psychiatrist that had a practice in Charlotte. But, and I loved that. I loved working as a psychologist. But then my first child came and that was just too much fun. I uh, retired from psychology and spent the next 10 years roughly raising children and doing all my little hobbies. Uh, a turning point came for me when uh, my parents and first husband and I went to Charleston for the home and garden tour. And unlike my grandmother, I was never really into gardening but I was totally struck by one garden where a woman's granddaughter was sculpted. She had a sculpture of her granddaughter in her garden. And I looked at that and I said, I know I can do that. Um, I tried to find sculpture classes at Holland's. They didn't offer it. I took one at Carolina and it was just constructing geometric forms, not at all what I was interested in. So I came back and lo and behold, after this weekend in Charleston, Queens College was offering a course in portrait sculpture. So I signed up for that, and this was 
in about 86, signed up for the course, took it, got great affirmation from my professor, so I took another and another, um, bought the tools for sculpting, sculpted in class with models, live models, um, some nude, some not. We did busts, we did figures, we did everything. So I'd come home and sit at my kitchen counter and do sculptures of my children. I would have them pose um, for hours and when they got tired of posing, I'd ask my sisters and brothers if I could borrow their children. <laughs> <laughs> so my brother Chip had the youngest child at that time her name was Jessie, named after my paternal grandmother. And so I gave Jessie my uh, St. Mary's High School yearbook to hold because it was just, I felt like a good proportion for her. She had on a new dress that she hadn't quite grown into, but um, she was just thrilled to be sitting there for me. And she did, um, a number of sittings and I worked with her with photographs and there is the sculpture that I ended up doing of Jesse and as I say this was in about 1992 um, friends started seeing uh, the sculptures I'd done of my children and began asking me to do sculptures of their children so I began doing, that was very intimidating uh, to try to please another mother, to see a child the way the child's mother sees the child. There's so many millions of uh, planes in a face and you can't get them all, but can you get the ones that are really key? That was the question. So I took on commission portraiture and had a ball. I just, um, I uh, did busts of some of my subjects. This, this little boy's uh, mother said, oh gosh, that was his brother in the first picture. She said, but you can't do Reed because he's lost a tooth. No, that's fine. And I said, I bet you we could. Let's just try it. And it turned out to be uh, one of my favorites. I would do usually all the siblings in a family. Uh, as I say, portraits and figures. I'd do sessions at the beach. Um, then got into standing figures. When you do a standing figure like this, you have to use a metal armature to hold the clay, which means the, ca the clay cannot be water-based because that would crack as it dries. So I've got a little bit of oil-based clay over here and some tools <clears throat> that you might want to look at. Um, so that was yet another step. One, you know, people would ask for, can you do my daughter playing a violin? And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do a violin? I did, and it turned out great, but it really pushed me um, to do something different. After a couple of years, of doing these portraits, Queens College came back to me and said, would you come teach the class that, where you started? And I said, oh gosh, I don't know how to teach. I know how to do, but I don't know how to teach. So I traveled around the state and visited with some sculptors, um, one of whom some of you might have heard of, Erling King from Winston-Salem, who also had a home at Hound Ears. And every sculptor I talked with was so generous with his or her time in sharing with me their resources, how they built armatures, how they set up their classes, um, and it really helped a lot. So I went back to Queens and taught in their art building in a beautiful setting for the Queens uh, art building. So I taught there for a number of years and then decided I still had children at home. I'd rather teach, I've got space in my basement. So I ended up starting to teach in my basement, which was so much easier because I could work at the same time. 
And then in 1999, we added a studio onto the house underneath the master bedroom. So I had a much prettier space to teach. Um, teaching was very rewarding. It was always adults, but what tickles me the most is how many of my students have gone on to sell their work and show their work in galleries, and nothing could make me prouder than that. All right, so I was just rolling right along, and one of my neighbors had a waiting list for uh, sculptures, and one of my neighbors came up to me and said, Kenny, I want you to do life-size sculptures of my daughters. And I said, gosh, I would really like to do a life-size. That would bring me full circle back from that Charleston garden. But I could never do two. And she said, well, it does me no good to have a life-size of one of my daughters and not the other. <laughs> so I said, well, I won't accept any money until I can be sure that I can do it. So I spent the day uh, taking photographs. I gave these two girls, I love to do skin, uh, wrists, ankles, arms, legs. Uh, that's much more fun than drapery um, and clothing. So I said, let's give girls bathing suits and I'll give them some water and they'll go out and play and let's see if I can get a good fun shot. Well, after about two days, this is the shot that I really liked of the Dooley girls. These are uh, Susan and uh, David Dooley's daughters, uh, the nieces of some of you know Bob and Ann Dooley. So I um, started, the, I worked in my studio home in Charlotte and then also they had a home up here and my parents had a home up here with a garage. So I worked in my parents' garage is now Jim's and my garage, uh, but I set it up up there and worked on, uh, you really had to do a big steel armature for this and use lots of oil-based clay, um, but I worked and worked and just uh, had a ball. I think the girls had fun too. Um, and there is the finished uh, sculpture. And as I say, it was right around the corner from my house, so I used to love driving by and seeing that fountain. Um, but I would have never guessed that I could have done that until she pushed me to do it. So um, that was completed in, I think, 06. And so I knew I could do it. Um, we were spending more and more time in Blowing Rock, and I had an aunt here, Aunt Grace Carr, uh, whom I loved. She was my mentor in golf, my other passion in life. And she and I played a lot of golf together. She had had breast cancer when she was in her 40s, and it had come back. She was in her 90s when it came back. Um, Aunt Grace had no children, and I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, oh. she had meant so much to the town of Blowing Rock. She'd been woman of the year, head of the Rotary Club, a tireless volunteer at the community library. And I, I had given her a little sculpture of Jessie, like that, that she kept on her mantle. And I woke up in the middle of one night and I thought, I'm going to do a life-size sculpture of Jesse in honor of Aunt Grace and see if the town of Bowling Rock will let me put it in front of the library. Um, well, Aunt, Aunt Grace was thrilled. And I said, well, what about, it? I've got to go to the town council and, and beg them to please let me donate a life-size sculpture to go in front of them. So I gave them, went to the town council with my little Jesse here, and um, I made my case, and surprisingly, they loved it. <laughs> they loved the idea. And so mom and dad said, okay, uh, if you'll do the sculpting and you'll get it cast, we will pay all expenses. Um, 
And I said, great, great. But I said, if I'm going to do one Jesse, if I'm going to do one life-size Jesse, I want to do three. One for the town of Blowing Rock, one for my backyard, because I want one to know, to be able to live with that and know that I could do it. And Mom and Dad were out, out at Southminster, so we did a third one for them. So this is how I started. I found my old sketches of little Jessie, little Jessie Tomlinson, and I took measurements. She had to be my model. Um, I've always worked from light, but I didn't have a life-size Jessie anymore, so um, I took the sketches I had and I took measurements. I had a steel armature made. Jessie sat right beside it. Um, the way you do this is you build up your steel armature with a lightweight material. Clay is very expensive and very heavy, so I used insulation and styrofoam to build up the bulk of the body. And I made, this is a detail, I made the legs so that they would slide out. They would slide in or out if I needed to cast them separately because her dress was going to overlap the legs. Um, so built her up, started putting on the clay. I did the hands and the head separately. Um, here she is, step by step. I would compare her, take pictures. Are the proportions right? Um, and they were. I worked on the head separately. So here she is in my studio. And if you look down below, you'll see the little pictures of Jessie as a little girl. So I had those to work with in this studio. <laughs> it's just a mess. But if you look carefully in the very back, uh, or center back, you can see the torso of Caroline, the, the little girl with the hose, the life size. I had turned her into a lamp, the, the, <laughs> the clay. Um, and there's Caroline again behind my arm. So I'm working with Jesse, and you can see all the old pictures. I never throw away anything working from the old pictures. But I sure did want um, a life-size model just to get all the measurements I never got. So I came up to Blowing Rock, and I did a search for a child who was about the same age and size of Jesse when I did her and I found Wesley Harwood, uh, a young girl in the community whose father happens to have been the business director of Brom. And I asked the parents, do you mind if she sits for me? And they said, no, not at all. So when Jesse, this is the original Jesse. She wouldn't work at all <laughs> 30 years later, 25 years later. So um, fortunately, Wesley did model for me. So when we finished, I don't know if you can tell on the toe of Jessie, I had her sign the sculpture because she put as much effort into it as I had. So when you go see the Jessie downtown, you'll see Wesley's signature on there. Um, my mold maker lives up here too. So that was, um, another reason to do my work up here. Instead of making it the St. Mary's High School yearbook that uh, Jessie was holding, I decided to name it um, for my Aunt Grace uh, using Peter Rabbit's um, logo on the front. And I strung it all together just to make sure. And then at that point, I was satisfied. It looked to me Enough like the original small sculpture, I was ready to cast. All right, lost wax casting is the most complex, the most boring, um, but it's an ancient process. And so I'm going to try to quickly go through and explain because it's one question I get as much as any. How do you cast? Well, first of all, you start with layers of silicone rubber. You put dividers where uh, you're gonna separate the mold. 
a piece this big cannot be cast in one mold. It has to be in sections. So the little rims you see are the different sections. So you start with layers of silicone rubber that capture every detail, very sensitive. Here is the mold for the little Jesse that you all are welcome to look up, uh, come and handle. But, and here are the legs. You know, I did the legs separately. After the silicone layers, you put plaster. And you can see here three sections, the head, the torso without the hands, and the skirt. Um, this is the mother mold. This mold will last for maybe 10 years under the right conditions. And you can pull any number of castings from the mother mold. But what you pull from the mother mold is wax, a wax casting. The mold is the negative. But, well, my sculptor is the positive. The mold is the negative. When you put wax in it, that becomes another positive. It looks just like the original clay. So you, they call it chasing the wax, is when you go clean up any, any uh, bubbles that happened in that process. And there's the middle torso section. This shows the bronze Jesse and the wax. Wax can be red, brown, any color. That's the wax casting of Jesse that comes out of this little mold here. So you have the wax casting, and the next step is to do create a waste mold out of a slurry. And that's like um, a slurry is a mix of silicone, silica, and sand. It's like um, stucco. You you rub um, you roll the wax in the stucco, and it attaches and creates another mold. Um, and to that you attach little sprues or um, channels for the wax to escape and for the bronze to enter. So you heat up these waste molds. There's a waste <coughs> mold, there's a wax casting and a waste mold for every bronze that you want to make. So I was making three there are three sets of waste molds, but only one mother mold. So you heat up the waste mold to melt out the wax. And the foundry, I use foundries in primarily Wyoming and Colorado. Uh, the foundry heats up the, the waste molds and melts out the wax, and they can reuse that. And then heats up the bronze in a crucible and pours the hot molten bronze into the waste molds. You let it cool, and then you take a hammer and break the mold. That's where the expression comes from. You break the waste mold. That's why it's a waste mold. Um, and you pull out the bronze. Here you can see that um, the skirt has been <coughs> welded to the torso, but her head and hands are, are yet to be attached. Um, they have to be welded together. And then once she's all together, they sandblast the bronze to give it a uniform finish. Um, and it looks sort of like terracotta. It's a flat, um, sort of whitish color. Now it's ready for patina, for the finish. So take her into the patina shop and they use a blowtorch and chemicals like ferric acid. I like a verdigris finish for the hair and the books and the clothes and I like to leave the skin, the warm tones that come from the ferric acid. So they keep blowtorching. That's really an art in itself patination. And here she is finished. Crated up in a box, put on a truck, and delivered to Bloimach. Um, a friend gave us the stone for the bench. 
my gardener, Graham Justice, um, who's no longer with us, um, had experienced Maoming sculpture and so she had bolted to that stone bench and that was no easy feat, drilling the holes through uh, the bench. So Jessie has made so many friends since she has gotten here. Um, Lonnie Webster has done a great job of capturing pictures and I just love the way she's been embraced by the town of Blowing Rock. Unfortunately, Aunt Grace died before she was installed, but she saw it, she knew it was happening, and I think it meant a lot to her. We put in a plaque there beside it, um, dedicating the sculpture to her. Okay, and then all of a sudden, in 2011, my life changed again. Uh, my husband had died in 2010, and I, and so had Jim Tanner's wife in 2010. We met in 2011. And I decided to move from Charlotte, my home of 65 years, to Raleigh, my grandmother's home. And we, um, and I decided to give the sculpture that had been in my backyard to Raleigh Little Theater um, so that um, it was there to honor my grandmother, um, which I love. So that was the three sculptures. There's just another little tidbit uh, addendum to this story that I think was interesting. Um, several years ago, I can't remember how many, um, this New Jersey elementary school principal and his significant other were riding bicycles through Blowing Rock and rode by the Jesse sculpture and he loved it. And he read my name um, under the sculpture and I can't remember, I guess he Googled it, I don't know how he found my phone number, but he called me up and he said, Kenny, I want you to do uh, my children up in Princeton, New Jersey, would just love to have a Jesse in front of their school. And I said, I don't have any more Jessies. And he said, well, you've just got to figure out a way to do a Jesse for me. And as it turns out, the Jesse we'd given to Southminster had not been maintained quite properly. Her patina was cracking off. Um, I don't have a picture of that. I don't want to remember that. But, um, and I said, well, Mike, I guess there might be a way we could do it. We could conceivably take that Southminster Jesse, cut her up, make a new mold, and cast one for you, and then put her back together again, re-patina her so Southminster gets a brand new Jesse, and you get a slightly smaller Jesse because every time you make a mold from an original, it shrinks a little bit. Mike was thrilled. Mike said, we'll do it. I'll find the money somehow. I'll find the money. Let's do ship the Southminster Jesse back to uh, the foundry in Wyoming. And they cut her up. They made the new mold. And they produced uh, the smaller Jesse. There we are at the ribbon cutting for Jesse. I went up there. And he said, I want you to come up to the ribbon cutting, and I did, and I thought that's great fun. But he said, now, I want you to teach all of my students the process of casting Jesse, every single one of these students, sixth grades. And I said, what? <laughs> I don't do that. So we did. We put together a show. Mike, as I say, the most persuasive man.
Well, there is money. Mm-hmm. It's once a year for your kid uh, and it's fun. But I would say you should watch it all. It's, it's a general study from the Center for Family Head Start. They're backing the kid from Johnson School away on it. And that will protect it for the next two years. But they had put a lacquer, I think, on top of the wax so that you would just wait.
had to be still in my Hamburg deal of getting in the way. So I fired so it's very hard when you take that and see how hard so the silicon was and they spray it with um I, I have the I'm on my drug here in West Jefferson and he puts like a Vaseline and thing on the fire spray and then puts a lot of the silicon in it. So it's a good question, but it, it comes off easily, usually. Uh, although I do have some original cats that have little blue pieces of and I make curly hair. 